Section 7 of Dutch Fairy Tales for Young Folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom May, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Dutch Fairy Tales for Young Folks by William Elliot Griffiths. The Ice King and His Wonderful Grandchild. In the far-off ages all the lands of northern Europe were one, for the deep seas had not yet separated them. Then our forefathers thought that fairies were gods. They built temples in their honor and prayed to them. Then in the place where is now the little town of Ulrum in Friesland was the home of the spirit in the ice, Euler. That is what Ulrum means, the home of the good fairy Euler. Euler was the patron of boys and girls. They liked him because he invented skates and sleds and sleighs. He had charge of things in winter and enjoyed the cold. He delighted also in hunting. Dressed in thick furs, he loved to roam over the hills and through the forests, seeking out the wolf, the bear, the deer, and the aurochs. His bow and arrows were terrible, for they were very big and he was a sure shot. Being the patron of archery, hunters always sought his favor. The yew tree was sacred to Euler, because the best bows were made from its wood. No one could cut down a yew tree without angering Euler. Nobody knew who Euler's father was, and if he knew himself, he did not care to tell anyone. He would not bestow many blessings upon mankind. Yet thousands of people used to come to Ulrum every year to invoke his aid, and ask him to send a heavy fall of snow to cover the ground. That meant good crops of food for the next year. The white snow, lying thick upon the ground, kept back the frost giants from biting the earth too hard. Because of deep winter snows, the ground was soft during the next summer. So the seeds sprouted more easily, and there was plenty to eat. When Euler traveled over the winter snow to go out on hunting trips, he strapped snowshoes on his feet. Because these were shaped like a warrior's shield, Euler was often called the Shield God. His protection was especially invoked by men who fought duels with sword or spear, which were very common in early days, or by soldiers or hunters who wished to be very brave or had engaged in perilous ventures. Now, when Euler wanted a wife to marry him, he made love to Scotty, because she was a huntress and liked the things which he liked, so they never had a quarrel. She was very strong, fond of sports and of chasing the wild animals. She wore a short skirt, which allowed freedom of motion to her limbs. Then she ranged over the hills and valleys with wonderful swiftness. So rapid were her movements that many people likened her to the cold mountain stream that leaps down from the high peaks and over the rocks, foaming and dashing to the lowlands. They gave the same name to both this fairy woman and the water, because they were so much alike. Indeed, Scotty was very lovely to look at. It was no wonder that many of the gods, fairies, and men fell in love with her. It is even said that she had had several husbands before marrying Euler. When you look at her pictures, you will see that she is as pretty as bright winter itself, when Jack Frost clothes the trees with white and makes the cheeks of the girls so rosy. She wore armor of shining steel, a silver helmet, short white skirts, and white fur leggings. Her snowshoes were of the hue of winter. Besides a glittering spear, she had a bow and sharp arrows. These were held in a silver quiver slung over her shoulders. Altogether, she looked like winter alive. She loved to live in the mountains and hear the thunders of cataracts, the crash of avalanches, the moaning of the winds in the pine forests. Even the howling of wolves was music in her ears. She was afraid of nothing. Now, from such a father and mother, one would expect wonderful children, yet very much like their parents. 
It turned out that the offspring of Euler and Scotty were all daughters. To them, one after another, were given the names meaning glacier, cold, snow, drift, snow whirl, and snow dust, the oldest being the biggest and hardiest. The others were in degree softer and more easily influenced by the sun and the wind. They all looked alike, so that some people called them the six white sisters. Yet they were all so great and powerful that many considered them giantesses. It was not possible for men to tame them, for they did very much as they pleased. No one could stop their doings or drive them away except Woden, who was the god of the sun. Yet in winter, even he left off ruling the world and went away. During that time, that is, during the seven months, Euler took Woden's throne and governed the affairs of the world. When summer came, Euler went with his wife up to the North Pole, or they lived in a house on the top of the Alps. There they could hunt and roam on their snowshoes. To these cold places, which the whole family enjoyed, their daughters went also, and all were very happy so far above the earth. Things went on pleasantly in Euler's family, so long as his daughters were young, for then the girls found enough to delight in at their daily play. But when growing up, and their heads began to be filled with notions about the young giants who paid visits to them, then the family troubles began. There was one young giant fairy named Vir, who came often to see all six of Euler's daughters, from the youngest to the oldest. Yet no one could tell which of them he was in love with, or could name the girl he liked best. No, not even the daughters themselves. His character and his qualities were not well known, for he put on many disguises and appeared in many places. It was believed, however, that he had already done a good deal of mischief and was likely to do more, for he loved destruction. Yet he often helped the Kabouter dwarves to do great things, so that showed he was of some use. In fact, he was the fire fairy. He kept on courting all the six sisters, long after May Day came, and he lengthened his visits until the heat turned the entire half-dozen of them into water. So they became one. At this, Euler was so angry at Veer's having delayed so long before popping the question, and at his daughters losing their shapes, that he made Veer marry them all and at once, they taking the name of Reichen. Now, when the child of Veer and Reichen was born, it turned out to be, in body and in character, just what people expected from such a father and mother. It was named, in Dutch, Stum. It grew fast, and soon showed that it was as powerful as its parents had been. Yet it was much worse when shut up than when allowed to go free in the air. Stum loved to do all sorts of tricks. In the kitchen it would make the iron kettle lid flop up and down with a lively noise. If it were confined in a vessel, whether of iron or earthenware, when set over the fire, it would blow the pot or kettle all to pieces in order to get out. Thinking itself a great singer, it would make rather a pleasant sound when its mother let it come out of a spout. Yet it never obeyed either of its parents. When they tried to shut up Stum inside of anything, it always escaped with a terrible sound. In fact, nothing could long hold it in without an explosion. Sometimes Stum would go down into the bowels of the earth and turn on a steam of water so as to meet the deep fires which are ever burning far down below us. Then there would come an awful earthquake, because Stum wanted to get out, and the earth crust would not let him, but tried to hold him down. Sometimes Stum slipped down into a volcano's mouth. Then the mountain, in order to save itself from being choked, had to spit Stum out, and this always made a terrible mess on the ground, and men called it lava. Or Stu might stay down in the crater as a guest, and quietly come out, occasionally in jets and puffs. Even when Jack Frost was around and froze the pipes in the house, 
or turned the water of the pots, pans, kettles, and bottles into solid ice, Stoom behaved very badly. If the frozen kettles or any other closed vessel were put over the stove or near the fire, and the ice melted at the bottom too fast, Stoom would blow the whole thing up. In this way, he often put men's lives in danger and made them lose their property. No one seemed to know how to handle this mischievous fairy. Not one man on earth could do anything with him, so they let him have his own way. Yet all the time, though he was enjoying his own tricks and lively fun, he was, with his own voice, calling on human beings to use him properly and harness him to wheels, for he was willing to be useful to them, and was all ready to pull or drive, lift or lower, grind or pump, as the need might be. As long as men did not treat him properly, and give him the right to get out into the air after he had done his work, Stoom would explode, blow up, and destroy everything. He could be made to sing, hiss, squeal, whistle, and make all kinds of sounds, but unless the bands that held him in were strong enough, or if fear got too hot, or his mother would not give him drink enough, when the iron pipes were red with heat, he would lose his temper and explode. He had no respect for bad or neglected boilers, or for lazy or careless firemen and engineers. Yet, properly harnessed and treated well, and fed with the food such as his mother can give, and roused by his father's persuasion, Stoom is greater than any giant or fairy that ever was. He can drive a ship, a locomotive, a submarine, or an aeroplane, as fast as froze boar, horse, or ship. Everybody today is glad that Stoom is such a good servant and friend all over the world. End of The Ice King and His Wonderful Grandchild